Jesus said, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every person. So when we think about global missions, let's not first think about missionaries, certainly not uh, George Verwer or organizations, but let's think about Jesus. Missions is a Jesus thing from start to finish. Just before he ascended into heaven, he said, ye shall be my witnesses. When the Holy Spirit comes upon you, you shall be my witnesses. In Jerusalem, here's Jerusalem, in Judea, Samaria, and to the uttermost parts of the earth. What a privilege it is. It has been for me 58 years to be involved in the Great Commission. First in my own high school, when through our prayer meetings in this ungodly high school, people started come to Jesus. And when I came back from university at Christmas break, hundreds came out to hear my testimony. And I didn't even know how to preach, but I preached anyway. And 125 stood in that meeting from my high school friends, including my own father, a son of an atheist who followed Jesus to 94 years of age. As we look out across the world, and we've just mentioned this in our question time, we have a lot to celebrate. We can't even begin to take the time to talk about what God's doing in South America. I speak Spanish, so that is a, a very special place on my heart and hope to get back there again soon. Our ship has seen phenomenal response there and the leaders of South American churches have said that the ship helped birth the whole modern missions movement in which we're seeing thousands of missionaries go out, especially of Brazil, but other countries as well, to the mission field. We don't have time to talk about the tens of millions that have come to Jesus south of the Sahal area. This is the tough area up here. These are the more unreached places. Algeria is the exception, but that response in Algeria is all among a minority group, the Berbers. There's no breakthrough to any degree among Arabs, uh, of course, who dominate the population. So this is, these are, these are the tough areas. We may touch on that later, but we celebrate all that's happened south of there. Not that there aren't still phenomenal needs. There are phenomenal needs everywhere, including across the street from my house in Southeast London. There's not time to talk about the unusual response in places like the Philippines, Singapore, Hong Kong, even certain parts of India, especially now among the Dalits, 200 million that are considered untouchables. And it's just amazing what God is doing around the world. But I want us to remember, as I just referred to in the question time, there are about 40 nations that just have very little. You can find them on my website, georgeverward.com. But right now, I'd like to pray for what I call the top 10. And I'd like you to unite with me in prayer as uh, these are what I consider of those 40 nations, the top, most difficult, uh, with very, very little going on. The first one I pray for is North Korea, which is a bit of an exception because there are quite a few believers there compared to, say, for example, Saudi Arabia or Libya or Tunisia or Turkmenistan. But South North Korea, North Korea I'm talking about, is in my top 10 because of the level of suffering, the extreme difficulty in any kind of evangelism and the massive persecution and imprisonment of Christians. Let's pray for these nations. You don't, by the way, have to close your eyes when you pray. There's no verse about that in the Bible, but maybe you have a different translation. And I, I always felt it was good for me because I'm so lustful. I'm always looking for the pretty girl coming into the prayer meeting. So it was always better to keep my eyes closed, though I, I did develop my own method of peeking through my fingers, which I had to repent of. Let's pray. Father, we pray right now, especially for North Korea. Father, that we would see a greater breakthrough in that nation. We believe there's a, there, there, there are some cracks. There are some openings. We're hearing stories. And so we pray for North Korea. And then we pray for Tibet, which has now been taken over by China, uh, where we hardly hear of any believers whatsoever. And we ask, Lord, there north of of uh, India, that you would send workers into Tibet and help us reach Tibetans who are refugees, uh, asylum seekers scattered around other parts of the world. And then we pray for Afghanistan, where the church is just being born, but where the, 
the level of difficulty for Christians is almost beyond description. And then we pray for Iran, which will soon fall out of the top 10 because so many Iranians are coming to Jesus. But it's still one of the more needy nations of the world. And Iraq that's gone through so much suffering, it's almost hard to describe. We pray for those who would go to Iraq and for Iraqi believers to rise up and build. And then we would weep and pray for Libya with only a couple of dozen believers and Tunisia with maybe a few hundred believers and Turkmenistan, the most limited access nation in Central Asia where all the nations are needy, but Turkmenistan stands out among them. And then we would pray, pray Lord Jesus, for Yemen and especially the island of Socotra where we hear there's not a single believer. And we think of Saudi Arabia and Somalia. Father, send forth workers to these places that somehow the church may be established and grow. For we ask in Jesus' name, amen. I find that praying for nations, which I've been doing, I guess, pretty well 57 years, pretty well almost every day, is one of the most exciting things uh, in my Christian life. That's why when I discovered this book, um, I guess about 35 years ago, in a, a very dull cover, a much smaller book that was not selling, I gave it to our publication department, a guy named Jerry Davey, and I said, I think we ought to put a new cover on this and give it another try. And let's back it with prayer. And I believe God's work is accomplished through prayer. Through prayer, this book became one of the most important, widely circulated books in the whole history of global missions. It, this is a new revised edition done by WEC, and it has update on every single nation in the world, a high percentage of the people's groups in the world. Just the section on Great Britain alone will blow your mind, much less China and India. And that's just one of many, many books that are available over there in the, uh, is it called the Hubble? And I hope you'll go there and get a copy of that. When you go there, also, you can get up to 10 books free of charge. We don't have time to mention all the titles, like True Grit, one of the greatest books ever written about women, what they're suffering, what they're doing, Why Pro-Life, AIDS Action. Sometimes in sessions, I have a whole hour just to deal with those subjects because we believe God has not called us just to evangelize the world. He has called us to social transformation, so social action, building his kingdom everywhere. And that includes right where we live. That's why missions always starts the moment we walk out the door of a meeting like this. But I'd love you just to visit that table. And if you take, and they're all free, most of the books are free. There's one section where we don't have so many copies. They're for a donation, including that book, Operation World. We had to put a price on that. But most of the books, including Michael Griffith's brilliant book, Take My Life, uh, including uh, this brand new book about Europe showing especially the growth of Islam in Europe. I think that one might be for a donation. And if you take at least five books, even if you just give them away, uh, because I know you have so much to study at uni, you can't always read a lot of extra books. Take them by faith for next summer or give them away. And if you take at least five, they give you this free bag. <laughs> no, this free bag's important because probably it'll rain in the next couple of days and this can be used as a nice rain hat. So I hope you'll pick up the free bag, really. I'm trying to be serious. There's Michael Griffiths, that tremendous Cambridge grad who got, became the leader of OMF, used to be China Inland Mission. That's one of his strongest books, one of the most important books in my life, going back, I think, 45 years. And I just celebrate that man. He's still uh, with us and worshiping the Lord. Turn with me now in your Bible. I had my Bible here. Well, well, well. <laughs> Who stole my Bible? <laughs> Somebody's going to breathe. <laughs> okay, thanks. Turn with me to the book of Romans, chapter 10. The book of Romans, chapter 10, for our scripture reading. You have to just be patient with me for a moment because I got a new Bible. Mm. 
there's Romans 6, Romans 7. I think you've gone through those already at this conference. Thank you. Pick it up at verse 14. No, I think it's better to start at 11. For the scripture says, everyone who believes in him will not be put to shame. For there is no distinction between Jews and Greeks. The same Lord is Lord of all, bestowing his riches on all who call on him. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Isn't that great news? Well, how will they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how will they believe in whom they have never heard? And how will they hear without someone preaching? And I really believe God is leading many of you, men and women, to go forth and declare and preach the gospel. I never thought as a young teenager that I'd ever do any kind of speaking in public. I had a lot of struggles in that area. And I'm just stunned at how God can give characters like me uh, the gift of ministering his gospel. Now more than 20,000 times in uh, probably 80 or 90 nations around the world. So we do need those who will preach. And how are they to preach unless they are sent? Yes, we need those who will send. As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the good news. How beautiful are the feet of those who preach the good news. What an amazing expression. And that's the privilege of every believer. For me, evangelism began that night that I came to Jesus. And as far as I know, every single day since then, I've been sharing my faith or encouraging believers and teaching them how to share their faith. And can you imagine the impact if all of us go from here with a greater commitment to sharing our faith? And if also, as we do that, we're willing for the Holy Spirit to send us to some other part of the world. There's a lot of mythology going around here in Britain, even more in America, uh, about missions. Even saying, well, missionaries from Britain and America aren't really needed anymore. The nationals can do it, and they live on a much much lower expense, and they, they know the languages and the culture. You know, I've lived in India, and India is one of those nations where probably nationals can do a lion's share of the work. We have 3,000 on our staff in India. They're mainly Indians, not all of them. The whole thing was birthed because of those men who back in the 60s joined me and went to India out of Cambridge and Oxford and a couple of other dozen universities. It's those young men, those missionaries who birthed this movement, OM India, that now has 3,000 churches, 107 phenomenal schools. I wish there were time to share more about it. So as we look at those other 40 countries, we're, we're, we're looking at where India was 100 years ago, 150 years ago, because already great missionaries had gone to India long before OM ever arrived, and we were building on their foundation. British missionaries are needed as much as ever before. It blew my circuits years ago when one famous Christian leader in this country, he later apologized, said, we, we can't send missionaries anymore. The need is too great here. We, of course, can do both. The Word of God teaches we must do both. No matter how many times characters like me go up and down the country trying to mobilize people, less than 1% will ever go. Are we worried about losing 1% from the challenging situation we face here? I live here. This is my mission field, though I do travel a lot. But I believe with all my heart, the Holy Spirit is still wanting to send forth workers. Just as the Holy Spirit sent that Cambridge 7 and people from most of the universities of Britain, that same Holy Spirit wants to continue to send. One of the secrets to make that happen is found in Matthew chapter 9. Turn there with me to verse 35 where we see the Lord Jesus going about all the towns and villages. Matthew 9, what a challenge just to look at the Lord Jesus. Verse 35, he went throughout 
all the cities and villages, teaching in the synagogues, proclaiming the gospel, the kingdom, healing every disease and every affliction. When he saw the crowds, he, was, he had compassion for them because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, please take this in your heart right now. The harvest is plentiful, but the labors are few. Therefore, pray earnestly to the Lord of the harvest to send out labors into his harvest. Would you like your CU to make an impact on the nations of the world? Then give greater emphasis to that missionary prayer meeting. I remember in those early days when I went to Cambridge, they were gathering, I think sometimes at lunchtime, to specifically pray for workers to be sent into the harvest field. This is the Lord's method for carrying on global missions, prayer. We see later on, or in the book of Acts, Peter was in prison. It was an impossible situation. But many were gathered together praying. The prayer meeting is a biblical practice, not just personal prayer. And you get people sometimes say, well, look, I believe in personal prayer. Pray every day. You better not ask them how much. But, you know, prayer meetings, I mean, isn't that a bit over the top, like for super spiritual? I believe with all my heart. The Word of God teaches the importance of the prayer meeting. In one of my newer books, uh, Drops from a Leaking Tap, I'm sorry we don't have copies here. I'd be happy to send it to you free as you email me. I have two chapters calling people to gather in prayer and how to keep prayer meetings alive and interesting. And I pray that the prayer meetings in your CUs will be one of the most exciting meetings of the week or the month. You may have to start small and let it grow. And don't worry if only a few come. If we turn away from the ministry of prayer, we make the, one of the greatest mistakes we can make in our Christian life. If you turn the page, you find in Acts 13, another prayer meeting going on. And in Acts 13, it says the Holy Spirit. Yes, the Holy Spirit is the chief executive officer of all missionary work. The Holy Spirit says, separate Paul and Barnabas for the work I have called them. I hope you'll get into the book of Acts. I have a video series on the book of Acts that I think has gone out on television with Paul Blackham and uh, Richard Pews. I have a, a, a CD series as well. I'd be happy to send them to you as a gift. I'd love to have personal contact. I'm not the leader of OM anymore. I said... Uh, Ten years ago, I turned it over to Peter Maiden, and four days ago, he gave it to Lawrence Tong from China, the new international director of Operation Mobilization. Woo! I get excited just thinking about it, especially as he has two sons. Looks like they're going to New York City University. Will you make a commitment even at this moment to pray for workers for these nations I've mentioned, would you make a commitment to pray through the book Operation World? Even if a group of you get together to buy a copy and then, you know, cut it into pieces and then pass it around and eventually pray your way through the whole book. And of course, one of the greatest prayer burdens is for our colleges and universities right here. Why am I still taking meetings in Christian unions? Because that burden God put on my heart for the universities here, it still burns hot. And I just long to be able to do more. That's why also I want to give you, as you leave, a free book. Because I've just got this little time with you, and my heart is just exploding with things I want to share. So you're, somehow you'll be kind enough to take a George Verwer book. And as you leave, and the, there'll be people distributing them at every door. But then you can go to the uh, Hubble and pick up a whole, uh, a whole plastic bag full of books. And now go to the next scripture, back into the Old Testament. Isaiah, the book of Isaiah, chapter 6, to one of the passages that God has used the most in terms of missionary uh, challenge. Isaiah chapter 6. Six. Here we are, 39, keep going, 7 and 6. Look at these powerful words. Hasn't it been wonderful to worship? I get the privilege of so much time to worship and so much great music. I was just in a Calvary Chapel in Boise, Idaho this past Sunday, about 1,600 people. And I there were so many new worship songs, I never heard any of them. I've now got two CDs from that worship group. And I want to just say this with all my heart, that one of the ways God is sweeping people into the kingdom by the millions 
is through the, the Holy Spirit working through gifted musicians and new songs. And we can sing the old ones as well. And praise God for those of you who have a gifting in that area. And make sure in your CU you've got some gifted people that can help in terms of the ministry of music connected with worship, but it also can be connected with evangelism. In Global OM today, there's about 6,000 of us. Two of the fastest growing aspects of our whole movement. One is the whole global sports ministry, and the second is the whole global arts ministry. And we've got every kind of artist coming on OM. I just can't even imagine. It's the same group of ragamuffins that drove out to India in 1964. But let's bring this to a conclusion looking at Isaiah 6. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord. I saw the Lord sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up. The train of his robe filled the temple. Above him stood a seraphim. Both had six wings. With two he covered his face, with two he covered his feet, with two he flew, and one called to the other, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. The foundation the threshold shook at the voice of him who called, and the house was filled with smoke. And I said, woe is me. Woe is me. I'm lost. I'm a man of unclean lips. I dwell in the midst of people of unclean lips. But my eyes have seen the king, the Lord of hosts. And one of the seraphim flew to me, having in his hand a burning coal he had taken from the tongs from the altar. And he touched my mouth and said, Behold, this has touched your lips. Your guilt is taken away. Your sin atoned for. Then I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send? And whom will go for us? And then I said, Here am I. Send me. And he said, Go and speak to this people. I've had the privilege of sometimes even up to an hour expounding that great passage of Scripture. I remember in a large Korean church in Sydney, Australia, when I felt burdened especially to expound that scripture and call people to pray that prayer, here am I, send me. And so the beginning of my sermon, my message, I asked, how many have already prayed that prayer? Because some churches I go to, 50% of all the people have already prayed that prayer. But that particular morning there in Sydney, only a few people raised their hand that they had prayed that prayer. To me, one of the most famous prayers in the whole of the Old Testament. But at the, at the end, as the Holy Spirit used his word in our hearts, when I called people to pray that prayer, as I'm going to do in a few minutes, most of the entire church stood up. And no wonder we see close to 10,000 Koreans across the world moving out in global evangelism. And in a few moments, I'm going to give that same invitation whether a few respond or many, because I believe it's a prayer every Christian, even a baby Christian, can pray. I think we make a mistake if we think this prayer, taking it out of context, is a prayer to become a missionary. It may mean that, and certainly this is one of the great missionary passages, but I don't see it that way. I see it as a prayer, and here's the key word, of availability. And I believe every one of you, especially after all the ministry these past few days, every one of you wants to be available. That's not asking too much. I think of Romans 12, 1, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. I must confess one of my favorite passages, Romans 12, 1. Again and again, God's used it to call me back to greater commitment. And so to pray that prayer, here am I, send me, it's an act of commitment. I think it's tied in with the message of the Lordship of Jesus that I have the joy of speaking about at Urbana and that I think you've had ministry on here during these days. If Jesus is Lord, then we can pray quite easily. Here am I, send me. It may be across the street. It may be in business or industry. It may be short-term missions. It may be longer-term missions. Short-term missions 
of course, seems to be one of the main ways that God is leading people to longer term. So many of our longer termers, many of them with OM 40 and 50 years, they only came short term. What happened? They saw that God could use them in a cross-cultural situation. Some of you will never know your gifting until you get in a cross-cultural situation. We had people that thought they'd never be able to live in a certain country. They fell in love with that country. They ended up marrying a girl or a boy from that country. And now we've got over 1,000 people claiming they met one another in Operation Mobilization. It's not supposed to be Operation Marriage. It's supposed to be mobilization. <laughs> But God has went in many ways in mobilizing. <laughs> By the way, one of the things I'm excited about the most is, is using modern technology and using even this little gadget we have in our pockets, uh, our telephone. Mine is, you know, old-fashioned now. It's a, it's a BlackBerry. It's considered out of date. But I'm still fascinated that I can sit uh, even during the worship time Oh, Lord, forgive me. And email people, <laughs> email people all over the world and pray for them. I want to be honest. I don't like doing two things at once, so, so forgive me, really. <laughs> I prefer, you know, three or four things at the same time. But it indeed has made my marriage rather difficult, and we will not go down that road uh, <laughs> right now. I'm excited about Twitter. I'm excited about people coming to Jesus through uh, the ministry of Twitter. I'm excited about Facebook, one of the fastest growing phenomena in the world, now competing with Hollywood. You can even go on Facebook and watch ordinary guys like me. In fact, I not long ago put on my new exercise program in the jumbo jet toilet. <laughs> and now we hear that Facebook, yeah, <laughs> nobody saw us. <laughs> and... <laughs> And now Facebook and Twitter and, and YouTube, it's going to merge. Have you heard that? I think even Bill Gates is upset about it. I think it's going to be called You Twit Face. <laughs> you haven't heard that yet. Well, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. That was a joke. Had no place in a proper message. <laughs> I've never been able to preach a proper message. So you can imagine how well I've gone over in some of our lovely English churches. <laughs> I remember especially one Anglican church. And I love the Anglicans, and many of them are on the move. Hallelujah. But this man told me I had 19 minutes to speak. <laughs> and, you know, so I, I just about begged him. I said, look, I'm new here. I'm cold turkey. I need a little more time. I'll never forget this gracious English smile. We understand that, and we are allotting to you 21 minutes for your message this morning. <laughs> Praise God for a, a lot more time that you've given me this evening. And I just pray that you would pick up one of my books and read a little more and give me the privilege of passing on to you the legacy that God has given me through at least a thousand men and women of God to Buck Singh of India, to Dr. Francis Schaefer of Labrie Fellowship, to Billy Graham, my spiritual father, to Oswald J. Smith, that great missionary diplomat who became the second most influential person in my life, to Elizabeth Elliot, and a number of amazing women that have influenced me in a mega, a mega way, including Debbie Maroff, who gave us that book, True Grit. But going back to this passage, let me ask, how many of you, and some of you have been around a while, you've been in other mission meetings, how many of you have already prayed the prayer, here am I, send me? Raise your hand. You've already prayed this prayer. Hallelujah. That is at least 40%. Please stand up. Those of you who raise your hand, stand up. You've already prayed this prayer. I want to pray for you. Lord, this is so encouraging. This is out of the box. This is mind-bending. This is almost ridiculous that so many have prayed that prayer and they're still here. What's happened, Lord? <laughs> but somehow God, somehow God, you're going to send, you're going to send some of these people, probably already did during this past summer. Help them meanwhile in their studies and preparation. Fill them afresh with your Holy Spirit as it was in Acts 4.31. For we ask in Jesus' name, amen. Please be seated. And now... Just think about this passage for a moment because I think that's more important. 
worshiping God, knowing God, experiencing his holiness. Then what? Repentance. Have any of you had some serious repentance during these days? It's completely normal in ministry like this. Without repentance, and for me it's often daily, I would not be here today. The key to personal revival is regular repentance and appropriating God's grace. To this day, I have to be careful with, with the lust of the eyes. To this day, I have to be careful with my tendency to be impatient and to say unkind words. To this day, I have to especially be careful with my negative streak. I have this horrific negative streak. I tend to see the dark side. God gave me a crisis experience. Praise God for crisis experience. But a crisis not followed by a process soon becomes an abscess. So I thank the Lord for both. But I was in Pakistan, and OM leader says, be careful what you say. The bishop's going to be there. In other words, don't mess it. They know I say at least he's two stupid things per sermon. Then another OM leader came. Look, could you dress properly? You know. <laughs> and uh, so I said, okay. The next day, I'm in this major meeting in the cathedral. I'm really trying my best. I'm in a suit and tie. I look like an undertaker. And guess what? Negative thinkers, if any of you have struggled like I do, fear I'll become the Darth Vader of the evangelical world. <laughs> Guess what? As I'm in speaking in front of the bishop, a pigeon <laughs> drops its load on my sleeve. Huh? <laughs> Typical, right? But God was doing a new thing. I said, praise Jesus, the elephants don't fly around here. <laughs> God's grace. God's grace. And so... I know the enemy attacks people when they think about global missions. If they're not getting total victory in the sexual area, if they're not getting total victory in, in their battle with doubts, and all my life I've struggled with doubts. Great faith is not in the absence of doubt. Yes, rough intellectual doubts, it's often in the midst of it. And so I'm saying with all my heart, don't hold back tonight. Don't be intimidated by your own humanness and by your own weakness. To this day, there are things about myself that I'm still uncomfortable with, but somehow I realize God loves me. God loves me, and it's his love, that basic, Jesus loves me, this I know, that's kept me going all these years when I've done stupid things, when I've failed, and I just know, even when I fall on my face, he still loves me. My closing story is an email by Tony Campalo in which it was a thunderstorm, even the adults were nervous. The thunder was horrific, the lightning was fierce. Then they realized their little seven-year-old was up alone in the bedroom. They ran upstairs and they opened the door. And there the little girls looking out the window. They said, are you okay? She said, I'm fine, as it was another flash of lightning. I think God is taking my picture. <laughs> Hallelujah. God is taking your picture. God has a phenomenal plan for your life. And I believe this pattern of Isaiah, worship, experiencing God, repenting, and then hearing his voice will enable us, yes, to pray this prayer with all of our heart. Here am I, send me. Wherever, whenever, in God's timing, let's close in prayer. Father, help us in these remaining moments to make what I believe is an important decision. Help us right now, in Jesus' name. Let's continue to pray. And if you'll pray this prayer, knowing it might be just across the street or it might be the ends of the earth. God leads different people in different ways. But if you'll pray this prayer for the first time, I want you to stand right now. And I want to just pray God's blessing upon you. And the books we give away can be a follow-up on this decision. God bless you. Stand right now and pray in your heart, here am I, send me. Here am I, send me. Yes, it may be into the world of business. God may prosper you so that you can put millions into global missions. I wish I had another hour to talk to you about the revolution of generosity that's spreading across the world, that's blessed organizations like OM and many others so that we could buy another ship, so we can reach another 10 million people with the word of God across the world. And I pray, if you have a gifting to make money, then put that in the hands of Jesus and let him use it. Is there anybody else? God bless you. God bless you. I wish I could talk to every one of you for an hour. The Holy Spirit will give you unlimited, unlimited fellowship. And there are people here who would be happy to pray for you and pray with you. Let's pray. Lord, I just thank you for this great response. I believe your Holy Spirit has prepared these young men and women for this moment.
I believe for some it's a very big, a very big move. For others, it may be just one more small step in an amazing pilgrimage. We thank you, Lord. Your grace is sufficient. Your strength is made perfect in weakness. And I know, looking back, at 58 years, living in your grace every single day, that if you can use a character like me, you can use anyone. And you want to use those in this great arena right now in a mighty way to accomplish your purposes. For we ask in Jesus' name, amen. God bless you. Hallelujah. Hallelujah.